So we started a series in John, and we're going to go through John chapter 8, and we'll hit November, and then we're going to switch gears a little bit, focus on Thanksgiving and, and what's going on in our hearts. Then we're going to focus on something called Christmas. And then in January, we start back up, and we continue all the way through Easter in John, and we end in John with the resurrection. And it just matches up so perfectly, like I planned it that way. Just happens. It's awesome. Last week we looked at uh, God is here. God came from the heavens down to earth. He came from He came from perfect heaven to messy earth. And why would He do that? Well, no longer do we have to think of, of God as up there looking down on us and everything that we're doing wrong. We we get to say Jesus came here and He understands. He understands what we're going through. He understands the pains. He understands the joys. We looked at different things that, that people called Jesus, the names of Jesus, and I, and I asked, so who do you call Jesus? What do you call him? Who do you call him? Lord, Savior, King of Israel? What is it? If you guys don't know, look back in John chapter 1. John is one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John does something different than the other uh, Gospel writers. He actually begins to explain some of the reasons why we're doing things. It's not just, hey, this is what happened and it was glorious. It's like, this is why Jesus said that. This is why Jesus did that. And John goes in to explain a little bit more than that. Today we're looking at, at, at learning more about Jesus. And that's not necessarily us, because I think we take so often many of these stories for granted. Whereas the disciples are just like, what's he going to do next? What is he going to do next so we can see his glory, so we can see his, his, his who he is? And so we start off with the wedding at Cana. And it's so interesting that his first wedding, or first wedding, maybe his first, his first miracle came at a place like this. So we pick it up in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him they have no more wine. Now a lot of us are thinking, who cares if they run out of punch, you know? Who cares if they run out of cake? We'll get to that in a second. Uh, dear woman, that's not our problem. We'll get to that in a second. My time has not yet come. We'll get to that. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. Fill the jars. Uh, when the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out. And take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servant followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though, of course, the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first. Then when everything, everyone has had lots to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. The miraculous sign at Canaan in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So we're going to, in his glory, we're going to look at Jesus as the guest. Now, last week, we learned a little bit more John, about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was a recluse, okay? He was behind the scenes. He lived out amongst, um, he, he liked honey and locusts. That's, that was his main dinner, okay? He didn't want to be around people. But Jesus was different. He, when he was invited, he went. And, and throughout the Gospels, we continue to see Jesus eating with the low lights or anybody that called on him to come on over. So he's, he, he, he not only eats with the, the high and mighty, but he's going down to the people that we would not normally hang out with. He accepts the invitation. He, he entered at normal, everyday lives and experiences and sanctified them by his presence. And like I said earlier, he... The Bible even says he eats with sinners. And Aaron Chambers wrote a fantastic book called Eats with Sinners. And I've talked about that book before. But we're not, always, not only do we see Jesus as the guest, we also see Jesus as the son. Now, weddings at this time, and a lot of you guys are like, I could never have done that. And as parents, a lot of you guys are like, I'm so grateful they don't do that. That, that wedding feast and these things would last three to five days before the wedding. Could you imagine that kind of budget? <laughs> Three to five days of just this wedding celebration. What could happen, more than just an embarrassment socially, that if you ran out of wine, uh, 
you could be fined. Uh, people could say, dude, the, the guy did not have enough food for all of us. I'm going to fine him for not having, the, having enough food. And so Mary approached Jesus probably because Mary invited Jesus. Mary is probably a close friend or uh, even a relative to this person. And Mary knew the inside track. How would Mary know that they were running out of wine? She wouldn't unless she knew the family. And so what she did is she went and said, Jesus, this is the problem. And he goes, woman? Yeah, try that one this week. <laughs> right. This was a normal, everyday, uh, respectful phrase at the time. Okay? Not so much anymore. And he says, why are you getting me involved? Two things are happening here. First, he's setting himself apart from Mary. At, so, so up to this time, he's a carpenter. He's building things. He's doing all this thing. And he's, he's basically under his mother's jurisdiction. Okay? Never married, obviously. Uh, it looks like Joseph is, is, has, is gone now. Out of the picture, dead. And so he is kind of stepping into a new role. He's distancing himself from being, this is not my problem anymore. And we're entering a new thing of he is under a new timetable. He's under a new commission. He is under what God is telling him to do now. So two things are going on. He's, he's distancing himself from Mary. I'm, I'm your son, but I am, I am totally different now. And I am, I'm on this whole new wavelength of, of answering to God and making sure his thing happens. John introduces one of the key elements of his record called the hour. And so now Jesus is on a heavenly timetable. So let me ask you, um, whose timetable are you on? Whose timetable are you on? Because for so long, and, and even now, I still find myself... Uh, picking and choosing what I want to follow in Jesus in God's timetable, you know, I'm still like mm, my idea sounds better. <laughs> but God, but Jesus says I am under a different timetable now. I am under a different jurisdiction. No longer do I live for myself, but I live for Him, and whatever He wills, I do. And so this is a this is a a, a huge idea for us. Not new, but a huge idea for us to, to, to really fully understand of whose timetable do you live on? Do you live on your timetable and do the things you want to do for your own pleasure? Or do you live for, for God's timetable and follow in his will? Then we see Jesus, the host, and he, I don't know if there was like a woman, this is not my problem but I'll do what you want, <laughs> you know? I don't know if he winked or if there was someone in his face. We don't know! But, but, but something that happens, Mary goes, do whatever he says. <laughs> Why? Because he, she knows, she knew from the beginning that, that this boy was different. This boy was going to grow up into the man. <laughs> he was going to grow up and save the world. And this is the beginning of that. The, the very beginning of, of, of him stepping aside, not as car carpenter and son of Mary, but son of God and Savior. So he was Jesus, the host. He said, uh, fill these six stone water pot, pots, they, they, about 25 gallons a piece. These were not movable things. They, they stood there. They stayed there. Okay, 25 gallons of something. That weighs a lot, especially water. The miracle showed something in the disciples. It revealed the glory and gave them a stronger foundation for their faith. And so as I'm talking about what we were doing experiences earlier as a church, everything around us, the very small things that is going on around us, that all we want to do is focus on this big picture. We never want to sit, look out uh, on the sides and, and behind and be like, look how far we've come. Look how all of these little things that Jesus has done in my life. Last week we talked about blessing upon blessing upon blessing. Uh, grace upon grace upon grace. It's everywhere. And yet, all we want to do is see the big picture God has, and we, we so often forget about the little things that he is doing in our life. 
There's another meaning here besides the meaning of human need and saving a family from social embarrassment. John uses the word sign. And that sign means something that points beyond itself to something greater. It wasn't enough for people just to believe in Jesus' works. Okay, and we're going to get to that at the very end of this chapter. It wasn't enough for them to just say, oh man, you are the Messiah. Yes, I believe in you just simply because they saw something amazing happen. That's not, it, it's, you have to believe in Jesus, not just what he can do. Your faith has to, has to be in Jesus, not his actions. Here's another little note. Um, wine at that time is not the wine today. Wine, it was like a table drink. Everybody drank wine at the time, okay? It was just, it was like water for them. So if they had something going on, it was wine. It was very highly diluted. It's not like the wine we have now, okay? Um, I've never, I'm, I'm, I drink wine. I like wine. I had, uh, nope, not last night. I've never been drunk, though, you know? I, I, that's one thing I can tell my kids. I don't know what it's like. I've never been drunk, okay? Never been Maybe it's because I'm 6'6". Six, six. I have no idea. But I've never consumed enough to be like, yeah. Um, I, I, I've been around, around, my dad was an alcohol and drug counselor for a long time. And uh, um, I've been around that stuff to know um, that if I'm suppressing something, there's something really wrong. If I'm suppressing something in my life through a chemical um, and I'm not finding just joy in everyday life, I need help. It was like I was with uh, the internet a long time ago. I was suppressing stuff. It was a highly diluted drink. And, and trust me, if, if people wanted to get drunk, there were other means at, at that time. They, they wouldn't just drink 45 glasses of, of wine. So, Another thing that we learn here is his zeal, his compassion, his spirit. Uh, zeal is a strong feeling of interest and enthusiasm that makes someone very eager or determined to do something. You know where I see zeal right now? And I don't care where you guys fall on this. If you uh, uh, support, support, I don't care. But when you can see 16 different tribes of nations come together, <laughs> that's a pretty neat thing. And what's going on with this uh, this uh, pipe to go to access pipeline, whatever it's called? Um, See, all we want to see is what we want to see, positive or negative. We don't want to see those simple things going on like 16 tribal councils together. Try to get 16 churches to do something together. I mean, that's what it's kind of like. I mean, the simple things of, of that is a very positive thing. Very positive. A strong feeling of interest and enthusiasm that makes something very eager and determined to do something. So we see his zeal here. It was nearly the time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem, and in the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle and sheep and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and the cattle, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor, and turned over the tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of her, stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then the disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. Passion or zeal for God's house would consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. And Jesus, uh, and, and so many times he does this. He's like, uh, all right, <laughs> destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise, raise it up. <laughs> I'm sure these guys are like, you are crazy, man. <laughs> Crazy man. Because they go, they go on to say, it's taken us 46 years to build this table and you say you can rebuild it in three days? And then, and then here's the meaning, okay? The, so John says this, John says, but, here's the, but when Jesus said the temple, he meant his own body. And so we go to the cross, just right there, we go to the cross and what Jesus did on the cross and then three days later, he's resurrected. But the temple is no longer a building, people. No longer do we have the holy of holies that God is only entertained in. Now we have hearts that he dwells in because of, because of his spirit. Now I'm glad you guys are here today. I really am. And, and, and we could even find a, a, a biblical right that we don't have to meet in, in churches anymore. We, we, we probably could find that because Jesus lives here. But there's also talk about the assembly of people. And that's why we have churches. 
Because I know many people that have fought that fight alone and they don't win. And we have people like us together at church battling for life together. And if you're not battling for life together, you're battling alone. And it's a lot harder to see a positive outcome when you're alone. And for this is my biggest I don't understand moment. I mean, for so many of us, we just come to the church and this is it. This is everything spiritual for us in a whole week. That's not enough. So we send out this reading plan, and please don't tell me if you read it, because then I'll be sad if you don't. But we send out this reading plan so you can connect to a real God and it's still a real living Bible or a real living app on your phone. <laughs> but to see God's word in action, that's why we have given that to you. He went into the church or into the temple. Um, each man was required to go to three Jewish uh, feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And this was Passover was approaching. And, and during this time, these, these people in the church would go in and be like, well, these people are going to need sheep and cattle, so let's, let's sell that. Let's do that. And so they were making a profit on the side. And, and as people came in, they would be like, oh, you need our currency. Okay, so give me some of this or trade this. Or, and here's our currency. And so what may be thought as a good idea, because I think churches have good ideas. I think we all have good ideas. Uh, flesh became involved, and they saw a profit be made. And that's what happened. And he couldn't that did not rest well on his soul. He made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. The priests had established a lucrative business of exchanging foreign money for Jewish currency and also selling the animals needed for sacrifice. Let me ask you no longer does Jesus live in the temple, but he has sent his spirit to live in our hearts and um, in our life to consume us. And so if Jesus were to come into your life, into your heart right now, what would he see? Is there anything that we need to get rid of in our hearts? Is there anything that we need to get rid of in our minds, in our life, that, that is not holy and pleasing to our God? Is there anything that, 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 that it's okay to, to let go of because it's not holy? It's not of God. Only good things come of God. When we give the devil a foothold, he's in. He's in. And it is hard to get him out. Every night we pray for, I try to, I try to teach my kids, be like, okay, we don't have to recite the same prayer. Okay? It's okay if we use different words. It's okay if we, we're not happy, but we understand the situation going on because my prayer, kids, and help us have a good time. I, I, that echoes in my mind. Help us have a good time. Yes, we want to have a good time. And here's the other thing we always pray about. Uh, God, keep your angels protected around this house. There was a time when we began this church, even before the church started, that we had several of our kids going through nightmares after nightmares after nightmares. And we, we, could, we could tell that that was, that was Satan attacking us. <laughs> through, our, through our defenseless kids. And if you think he won't work that way, you're lying to yourself. The devil will work in any way possible to get your attention off of God. And so we began to pray this prayer, and it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't immediate, but after a while, we could just feel this sense of peace come over our house. That is still a prayer we pray. I'm not into routines. My life... Like, my personality would love not to have routines, but my personality has to have routines, you know? 
just so I'm, I'm being productive. But that is one thing that we will never stop praying, is for God to keep his angels protected around our house. Would you guys pray that this week? See what, I mean, honestly, honestly pray that. Don't just, Derek told me to pray this prayer. So I'm going to do it. And I don't care about the results. If you want protection in your home, if you want protection in your car, if you want protection around you, pray for protection. And then look for the peace that comes. And take a step closer to Jesus. The very last thing I have to say today is his knowledge, verses 23 and 25, because of the miraculous signs. And we don't know if, I mean, so far we've seen one sign, okay? We've seen one thing. He, he turned water into wine. So we assume that there are other things that were going on that we may not know about. Okay? We just have to assume that. Because of the miraculous signs that Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many people began to trust in him. That's what we want, right? I mean, we want people to trust in him. Well, this next verse is a little bit scary, okay? So you might want to hold on or grab somebody's hand beside you because this is what it says. But Jesus didn't trust them. But Jesus, I, I'm trusting you. And he says, but I didn't trust them. He didn't trust them. Because he knew all about people. No one needed to tell him about the human nature, for he knew what was in each and was in each person's heart. He knew that if I saw a sign, Jesus turned um, these walls pink. And Jesus, you that was pretty great. That was awesome. And you, the you're the you're the man, Jesus. It doesn't make me trust him anymore. It makes me trust what he just did in his actions, not him as a person and savior. And so Jesus, uh, people are either believing in his miracles, but what he's asking us is to believe in him. No one needed to tell him about human nature. Why? Because he's lived human nature for 30 years up to, the, up to this point. He understands people. Even I understand how fickle people can be. Like one, yeah, yes, that's it. Yes, I'm good. No. Oh. Okay. Oh. That's that's one of that's one of my let me be honest here. That is one of my hardest things working with people in the church. It's so hard sometimes to deal with the people. To deal with people. None of you. <laughs> None of you. Um, I'm sure some of you are like, oh, gee, she's looking at me. No, none of you. Um, but just how fickle people can be with their words, with their actions. I, I know a lot of people that really want to love Jesus. They really want to love God. They want to put everything, you know, they, Jesus is not looking for your, your outside appearance. He looks at the heart. I dated a girl in college for a little bit. Obviously, before I met man, okay. that her car um, was pristine on the outside. Oh, it was it was beautiful. When you got inside, you'd be like, "Dude, have you ever cleaned this car in the last three months?" I see like McDonald's wrappers all over it. What is that? I'll take my own. We'll meet there. And so much of our lives is that is that. The, I'm going to put on my, my church stuff today, and I'm going to be churchy today, and I'm going to be godly today, but inside we are just eating away at ourselves and our own sin. Hey, well, we can put whatever mask or whatever we want to put on. It doesn't matter. Jesus knows what we're thinking. He knows what, what's inside our heart. He looks at the heart. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows human nature because he knows what is in each person's heart. So let, my, let your prayer be, I hope your prayer is this. God, my, help, my heart is filthy. <laughs> Maybe, God, I've allowed some things to come into my heart and I don't want it. Or uh, uh, 
God continue to mold and shape. Because ultimately, we want to be like you. And there's a long way to go. So the, the thing we got to see today was Jesus learning about Jesus. The disciples learning about his... He just turned water into wine. Holy cow. And it was good wine. <laughs> Not this poor table wine. Was... We got to see his zeal and compassion... And see his glory. And right here for the first time, we see his knowledge of us. We see his knowledge of us. Like, we don't have to say things. He knows things. But just like any relationship, I want to be able to talk with my wife, not just have her know what I'm doing. <laughs> so this relationship with Jesus is a... Yeah. It's a back and forth. I don't know where you guys are. I know it's we haven't seen some of you guys for a little while. I'm just so glad to have you guys with us this morning. Some of us have been here every week. <laughs> if there's ever a good time to get on a pattern or a rhythm, it's now. Kind of things are behind us. Summer's behind us. Holidays are behind us. We have some coming up, but a little bit of time. But to get in the pattern and rhythm of loving Jesus, of knowing Jesus, of learning about Jesus, and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to learn. I, I cannot get into everything going on in, in John. I can't. It, 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 you guys have a responsibility to keep up with where we are. Okay? This next week is John 3. We, we, there's a lot of stuff happening right now, guys. In John, there is, there's so, I can't preach on everything. Last year we did, uh, is it 50 days and 40 days? What did we do? Really long series. Story of, story of Jesus, story of us. The story. The story, hey! <laughs> Thank you. 31 weeks. Story of us is like a new parenthood on TV now. Okay. Oh no, we're in. okay. Anyway, we did the story, and uh, um, that was really long. I don't want I don't want this to become something so long. It's like, oh, are we ever going to finish? Because there's so much going on. The, the the true reality of Jesus is seen. His compassion will be felt. Let's pray. I'm over. Uh, Father, thank you so much. God, I ask that you cleanse our hearts and our minds. God, I'm sure my heart is just like that temple. <coughs> you, there are things that you want to tip over and whip out of my heart, my mind, God, and so I do that so I can think clearly, so I can think purely, so I can see people the way you want me to see them and not the way my flesh cries out to them. God, thank you for planting revive very honored and humbled to be a part of it. God, we have no way to hit any mark. But God, we can look back and think of all the people, all the things that you have brought us to, all the people we've met. And God, I pray that lives have changed because of you working through Revive and its people. God, I pray for uh, people in this room right now that really just need to make a decision that says, God, I need you to clean house. God, I need you to build a base around me. God, I want to focus on you. I want to focus on your glory. I want to have your zeal and life, your compassion to, to love people and to, to seek out good. God, your, your knowledge of my heart is overwhelming me. So, Father, that anything that gets in there that's not of you, would you please take it? Would you please get rid of these little dark spots all over my life that I've allowed to get in? And this morning, Father, we come on bended knee, we come on arms raised, we come with a voice that you're 
that your life was sacrificed so that we could have life. So thank you for rebuilding that temple three days later and for allowing the Holy Spirit to work with us. In your name we pray. Amen.